Uh, first of all, I would, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Wonoli and Professor Chang Yopar for a uh, very nice introduction and warm hosting. Today, uh, I'm going to talk about the uh, uh, gravitational ranging in gravitational wave. Usually, yes, uh, this topic, it seems like this topic covers lots of things, but today I would like to focus on my uh, recent work. But uh, let me start with the uh, uh, history of the gravitational ranging. As you, many of you know very well, uh, Einstein uh, proposed the observation of the vented light around the sun in 1913, about 100 years ago, more than 100 years ago. And then uh, Eddington and his colleague confirmed the, and observed uh, really the light behind the sun yeah, uh, around this uh, around this sun when uh, there was the total eclipse. Who is the gentleman? George Ellery Hale? Uh, Einstein letter to... Ah, uh, yeah, George Ellery Hale. I have no idea, actually, I uh, just yeah, stole this picture from a textbook. And then, yeah, in the present, uh, the gravity ranging in the astronomy is very common and frequent event. Uh, we can easily observe them. So basically, when a light source is very far away from us, and in the middle, uh, there is some massive system like the galaxy or galaxy cluster, then the light from the far source uh, travels around this massive light system and the path is bent around the massive system because of the uh, gravitational potential by the light system. Usually, uh, this image is the first uh, publicly released image from the James Webb Space Telescope, shortly JWST. And then uh, when we focus on this box area, then there are lots of lens images. Actually, the cyan circles is uh, identified before the JWST and the green circles are uh, newly identified with the JWST. So yes, in the electromagnetic wave-based astronomy, gravitational lensing is very common. So yeah, let me move on to the gravitational lensing in the gravitational waves. So similar to light, uh, we believe gravitational waves also can be lensed by some massive lens system because we know that many uh, fundamental properties of the gravitational waves were very similar to the light. Uh, for example, the speed of it, they propagate on with the speed of light and they uh, propagate on the space time of the, our universe. So uh, in order to consider this uh, gravitational lensing in gravitational waves, uh, we firstly define the amplification factor uh, denoted as the big F in the frequency domain, where the A sub L and A sub U means the lensed and unlensed gravitational signal respectively. So as shown in this scheme, uh, we think uh, gravitational wave, unlensed gravitational wave, originally radiated from this kind of binary system, uh, we already have detected from those uh, gravitational wave signals. Then, when this uh, online signal propagate in the space time, and if they uh, meet some lens system and their uh, its gravitational potential, then the light path is uh, bent around this lens system, and we may observe the lens signal, uh, which uh, imprints the some more magnification or demagnification or some phase uh, difference from the original one. Usually, uh, 
yes, this is kind of the simple, simplified, but because uh, we assume that the those lens and source system is by, very, very far away from us. So uh, we usually or typically uh, create this uh, gravity lens in with this kind of the thin lens, so-called thin lens approximation. So putting these uh, lens mass system onto the, this two-dimensional plane, uh, projection, uh, projecting the, the three-dimensional uh, structure to the, this two-dimensional plane. And also we assume the source system is also is on the some kind of two-dimensional plane. Uh, so for this kind of configuration, uh, we can compute the amplification factor big F and arrival time of the lens gravitation signals in wave optics. So as I mentioned, uh, with adopting the thin lens approximation, we get this big F in this form, uh, where this uh, vector X means the position of images on the lens plane, and the Y means the position of the source on the source plane. And the, here, the, this uh, quantity is the arbitrary normalized constant of the length, and the TD means the arrival time at the observer from the source. Uh, and in here, yeah, you can see that this TD is in this exponent, and this is, uh, type, the arrival time is yeah, written as like this. So here, the psi is the non-dimensional deflection potential depending on the, the mass and gravity of the lens system. And uh, time is some arbitrary constant to be chosen to make the minimum value of the TD becomes zero. So here you said you adopt thin lens approximation, but do you use your knowledge Well, actually, because uh, we define this F in this manner, so we specifically consider null geodesic for this uh, kind of the gravitational engine. So null geodesic and photon and uh, really a metallic particle they follow exactly the same pattern. Yes. Well, I haven't seen that kind of analogy, but I think yes. It follows the null geodesic analogy. So, uh, okay. uh, you any information about the polarization? Here, we don't consider polarization. So, we only consider the right path and how much the original signal is amplified or magnified or demagnified. Yes, with this amplification factor. So, which part of the can you control to uh, make the normalization? Uh, so, yeah, let me show you. In the next slide. Okay. Yes. So, uh, in previous slide, I showed the amplification factor in the wave optics, but uh, according to the Takashi Nakamura's uh, work in 2003, the amplification factor big F in wave optics converts to the geometrical optics limit when the dimensionless frequency are defined with omega defined with this manner is bigger than one, where here the MLZ means the relative to the land mass. And with following this condition, if we suppose the MLZ land relative to land mass in range of this, this much of the uh, masses, then this convergence condition to the geometric optical limit converted to the frequencies bigger than 0.1 hertz, uh, which fully covers the current ground-based repetition of detector sensitive frequency band, uh, typically in this 100 to 1,000 hertz. So yes, uh, more creating the gravitational lensing in wave of this very natural treatment, but uh, for convenience, because the computing the integral for all possible lensing position, over the possible uh, or over times is very computationally expensive. So uh, computing this lensing amplification factor in geometric optics limit is uh, quite convenient to 
uh, reproduce or mimic or study the landing phenomena. And so for the lens system, there are many options for the lens, uh, lens system models, but uh, the simplest one is the point mass lens. So uh, this lens model means the mass is uh, described describe as the two-dimensional theta, theta, uh, theta, theta function in the lens plane. And yes, here is the answer to some chance question. Uh, so for convenience, we said the normalized constant is equal to the Einstein radius of uh, lens system. Uh, in this point mass lens model, uh, the Einstein radius is computed with this manner. Actually, yeah, the, here the D means the angular distance to the from the source to lens and set source and the distance between the lens and source systems. So yes, depending on which kind of lens model is chosen, uh, we can set this question up in uh, based on the uh, chosen lens model. Do you need to know the ML precisely? ML? Yes. Uh, it's uh, not the just, just the mass of the lens system, not the lens floor. But, but to uh, normalize your system, I guess you you need to know ML. Yes, but we can choose this ML as the preparameter, and uh, in our work, yes, we choose this ML in this range. Yes. Yes. And then uh, with adopting this uh, gravitational lensing in geometric optics limit and with this uh, point mass lens model, then uh, we, we can write this amplification factor in the integral form into the, this one. And this mu plus minus means the magnification factor uh, and the delta T B means the time delay between the arrival times so of the two lens system, uh, two lens signals. Actually, uh, this equation shows that uh, there are two lens uh, two lens images or lens signals can be produced by the lens system. Yes. 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 Yeah, so if you put the number to here, then yes, the. As I know, the normal galaxies black hole or supermassive black hole is much heavier than, for, for example, 10 to the 9 to 10 to the 12 or something. But uh, actually, in my work and in our work, we consider uh, this specific mass range to uh, reproduce some called the micro lensing signature, not the gravitational lensing by the actual galaxy systems. Uh, to be honest, actually, uh, this computation is done by the uh, done because of the uh, the referee pointed that why you choose the geometric of the limit. But yes, to answer the question or comment, yeah, we found this region. Okay. Uh, now let me move on to the my actual work. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Yes. Um, well, when ML is much larger than this guy, yes. you certainly satisfy your condition I one, right? Yes. Why this particular mass yes. is chosen? It can be ten to ten. Ah, uh, yeah, right. But uh, typically, the micro lensing system or micro lensing phenomena uh -huh. can be done by these mass ranges. Okay. So, so uh, okay. yes, there is some. There is case. Yeah, more. Uh, Assumptions or suppose. Uh, you mean that if the mass is larger, you would get, you would get uh, events that uh, these are already excluded or more easy to see. Uh, actually, the the fundamental reason of the choice of this mass range is the 
depending on the mass range, we compute this uh, different uh, time delay. Yeah. Uh, okay, here, sorry, here. So if we put the much heavier mass on here, then we expect much longer time delay between the lens and signal, but actually micro lensing is supposed to the, the time delay of the micro lensing is supposed to be order of one or 100 milliseconds. So in order to produce that much of the time delay, uh, this less choice is the inevitable. So yes, uh, recently we developed a uh, a search method for the search, uh, searching the lens gravitational waves, uh, specifically the micro lens gravitational waves uh, with the beam learning. And the work is published in 2021 and this October. So uh, in this work, uh, we motivate by this. Uh, the assumption the gravitational waves can be lensed when they propagate near a massive object. So, uh, because we believe the gravitational lensing of gravitational waves is quite similar to the gravitational lensing of light, so we also uh, expect the uh, more possible lensing signature called the strong, weak, and micro lensing. So, usually the strong lensing produces the two lens images. Uh, arrive at different time, but uh, depending on the lens model or lens system, so typically when we call the gravitational engine is weak, there's no multiple images, only one single magnified images. And also when I answer to the Scopas uh, question, uh, the micro engine produced the very short time delays between the lens system. So, uh, depending on the lensing configuration and the characteristics, we uh, categorize the lensing phenomena into this kind of manner. So we, anyway. Uh, Jung Min. Yes. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, so can you explain uh, in, in more detail about the definition of strong weak and micro lensing? Uh, sorry, could you repeat your question again? Uh, can you I mean, explain the, what's the difference between strong, weak, and micro range? Uh, yeah. So, so okay. Maybe explain the, I mean, the definition. Yes, I see. So basically, strong ranging means that we can produce multiple images or lens images. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the weak lensing, we suppose only one single lens images, which is represented with the some magnified or demagnified by the lens system. And then micro lensing uh, denotes the or referring the uh, the lensing phenomena, which can produce multiple lens images, but the uh, uh, the lens mass is much, much smaller than the typical strong lens lens system. That's the, the simple uh, mm -hmm. categorization for those terms. Mm -hmm. Is that enough? Yeah, okay, I see. thank you. Okay, thank you. And yes, except this weak lensing, uh, we expect to detect multiple lens signal at different, different times. Maybe it's repeated signals, but uh, even though there were uh, comprehensive searches for the uh, any gravitational lensing signature in, uh, imprinted in the gravitational waves, uh, there has been no widely accepted uh, detection <coughs> thus far. <laughs> and as I mentioned uh, in this work. Uh, we focus on the micro range of gravitational waves. Uh, shortly, I will refer to the phenomena as the GW micro range, uh, which can be caused by the stellar object uh, smaller than 10 to the 5 solar mass, uh, which is typically embedded around the macro range systems uh, like the galaxy or galaxy cluster. But uh, some people are imagining that uh, this uh, mass 
correspond to the so-called the compact dark matter system or intermediate mass black hole system and so on. But uh, we just simply take this number not uh, regarding any specific uh, astrophysical system. And uh, as I already mentioned, the G double micro ranging uh, is expected to, to uh, produce the range signals arrive at the gravitational detectors with the order of this amount of millisecond of the time delay between the multiple lens signals. And because of this uh, amount of time delay, we expect the, the lens event or signals arrive, uh, make the superposition. And then the superposition lead the interference patterns, uh, also known as the beating patterns, uh, as shown in this right panel. So actually, you can see there's two peaks at the end of the signal. And the first, the larger peak is the arrived first, and the second smaller peak is around later, arrived at later. So the superposition of the signal makes this kind of modulation in the waveform. And we specifically seek these kind of beating patterns from gravitational wave signal or binary black hole events. Uh, so when we simulate the kind of the micro ranging on the black hole binary, uh, binary black hole system signal, then we can get this kind of the two dimensional image of the time and frequency, uh, which is uh, simply converted from this uh, time domain waveform to these images. So uh, as you can see, we can see there are uh, interference patterns or nodes on the signal. And there's the two peaks at the exactly the same time of the time domain signals. And actually this work is the first uh, deep learning based search for any lensing signature. And in this work, we revisit the 46 BBH events in uh, gravitational wave, first and second gravitational wave transient catalogs already analyzed by the AVK collaboration. And we search the micro ranging signature, G double micro ranging signature from uh, this kind of spectrogram. Uh, we, have, we call this kind of two dimensional image as the spectrogram. So we train the deep learning model, <coughs> sorry, deep learning model with the simulated uh, spectrogram samples or signals. And then yeah, we evaluate these real uh, BBH events published in public. And the protocol is a string? The protocol is the, 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 the top below. Yes. Uh, the below here? The yellow. Blue and the yellow uh, so this ye yellow shows the uh, energy of the this, this signal and the blue is the, the so yeah we typically think this yellow part is corresponding to the real signal and this blue part is the just from the ba background noises so the kind of threshold you put a threshold or something to to see the success, this yellow region? Uh, actually, we haven't considered specific any criterion threshold yeah, for getting this kind of spectrograph. But uh, it's nothing but the uh, Fourier transform of the time domain signal. Then we can this kind of frequency evolution information. So yeah, we just put those time and frequency information into this single yeah, two dimension plot. How do you generate this set of signals? We, I will show you later. So, in order to train the deep learning model, uh, we have to prepare the proper training samples. So, in this work, uh, we assume the strong lensing, of course, with uh, this amount of the mass uh, lens systems. 
uh, which can produce the similar time delay as it, as if it were GW micro lensing. Uh, more naturally, uh, people, many people believe that GW micro lensing can be happen the very small stellar mass object uh, embedded around the galaxy system and so on. But in order to avoid any some computational cost or, or some problem, yeah, we some kind of uh, detour the this, uh, direct approach. And then, yeah, <coughs> sorry, we produced a similar uh, micro phenomena with this kind of assumption. And for simplicity, we uh, adapted the point mass lens model in geometric optics limit. And we generate the samples with these parameters. And actually, uh, in order to simulate the uh, waveforms, we just simply adapted this uh, a waveform model called the IM phenom PV2. So yeah, this uh, kind of we can implement this kind of waveform model with the uh, uh, open source Python package. So we are uh, giving this kind of parameter values, then we can easily reproduce the signals. And then uh, we computed this amplification factor with this mass uh, lens mass and this parameter setup, then we uh, produce the Land, micro lens cryptic signal samples. And then uh, in reality, the, we cannot fully remove the uh, background noises. So in order to mimic the, those irremovable noises present in the spectrogram, we adopted noise model, uh, one of the uh, public noise models uh, is the advanced live design sensitivity. Uh, you, you, you have a pretty generous uh, range of parameters. Uh, for example, are pretty random. What, what do you think uh, the, uh, the machine actually learned? Uh, we expect the machine or deep learning model to learn the, the feature of the beating patterns shown in the spectrogram not exactly the value of the parameters. So our goal is to let the model train the model to distinguish whether a detected signal is lensed or unlensed one. Is 3D already set in, in, in this parameter? Uh, yes, so for the lens the signal, we put this uh, lens mass and distance to the lens and distance from the lens to source. Yes. Uh, I see time delay is between 2.25 and 3.52. Yes, and so with those parameters, we get uh, this amount of the magnification factor and time delay. Right. But you see, it is, uh, the time window is pretty large, millisecond to second. Yes, right. The skilled machine learn. So, yeah. If we concentrate on the really millisecond of the time delay, mm -hmm. then we suppose the trend machine or trend uh, deep learning model is uh, rather biased. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, to make the model to be confused with the, any possible real unlimited signal, mm -hmm. but actually the time delay makes the yes. The cadence of the interference pattern. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we accepted rather larger time delays for the training samples. Mm -hmm. So, how, how, how did you validate your um, machine? <laughs> uh, the typical manner for validating the trained model is the using another set of the samples, which is not used in the training yeah, phase. So, but anyway, the typically the testing data is also simulated one. Uh, so we already tested the 
the model's validity with the another set of the different, uh, uh, another set of uh, samples uh, generated with different range of parameters. So probably you may find the validation result from one of my yeah, paper. And then, uh, so the implementation of the deep learning model, uh, we adopted one of the state-of-the-art uh, deep learning models called the VG19. And in general, it is known that the one single learner or trained model may predict the bias result. So in order to avoid that kind of the uh, misclassification, so we introduced the ensemble, so-called the ensemble learning, uh, which is nothing but the training the same model with the different parameters. So uh, with this kind of uh, approach, we prepare the 10 ensemble learners with returning the random state for the same training data. And then we built a, a binary classification scheme uh, with these four steps. And we firstly classify, uh, we call it the first classification as the initial classification on each detector's data based on the prediction from the deep learning model. And this, the prediction is uh, represented as the probability uh, to the lens classes from the ensemble learners. And then second, secondly, uh, we uh, apply the majority voting for the initial classification result to get this temporary classification result on the each detector's data. And thirdly, we primarily classify those the detector's data for each event uh, based on the consistence, consistency between those class of each detector's data of an event. And then we finally classify an event, whether the event is lens or not, uh, based on the follow-up analysis and cross verif uh, verifications. And especially for the uh, follow-up analysis or cross -ver verification, uh, we also built a p-value model from the performance test on the testing data, which is not used in the training phase. So uh, we know that in statistics, uh, when we compute the p-value, uh, and the p-value is uh, smaller than this 0.05, then it means the uh, accepting the testing hypothesis. But if the p-value is uh, bigger than this threshold, then it means the rejecting the testing hypothesis. Or alternatively, accepting the null hypothesis. So based on the typical uh, criterion on the P value, uh, we uh, plot this kind of the probability versus the P value. Then we found that uh, the P value equals 0 0.05 meet the probability value is the 0.6. So we take the uh, detection criterion as this, those two quantities satisfy this condition. P is smaller than 0 0.05 and the probability is bigger than 0.6. So we take this condition as the, our empirical criteria. So the, our model predicted this result that uh, pro, uh, provided the probability to the each detector data and from the, prob the probability from zero to one, between the zero and one for the all events and all available data. And based on the probability, we uh, initially classified the uh, each detector's data into this either unlanded uh, or lensed one. And then by computing this, uh, the majority of the classified cl or classes, we get this temporal classes of the each detector data of each event. And 
for the primary classification, we compare the consistency between the classified uh, classes on each detector's data. And we found that only one event, uh, GW190707, uh, is classified, primarily classified as the length one out of the 46 events. So in order to check whether we really make the new discovery on the lens signal, so we uh, made a follow-up analysis on this event by computing this uh, median probability uh, obtained from the all ensemble learners. And then we got uh, this rather higher probability, uh, which is satisfying the, our empirical criteria on the probability. But when we compute the p-value of this uh, median probability and its uncertainties, we get this rather, rather uh, wider range of the p-value, which is marked here. And we found that this uh, uncertainty on the p-value is uh, also have bigger value than this, uh, our p-value criteria. So because this event uh, didn't satisfy this, those two criterion or our empirical criterion, uh, we concluded that this is uh, less likely a landed event. And also uh, as a cross verification, we checked the value uh, in published in the paper, uh, which is called the base factor of this event. And the, in this paper, uh, we set the empirical criterion for accepting the lens hypothesis on the base factor is the 0.2 plus 0.2. But uh, for this event, we found that the base factor is, uh, was the minus uh, 0.4, uh, which means uh, disfavoring the lens hypothesis. And also, when you look at the evaluated spectrogram images, uh, we couldn't see any uh, visually recognizable beating patterns on the chop signal. So conclusion of uh, this work is the, even though the trend model and our classification scheme classified this event as the, might be a lens signal, but from the, uh, probability and p-value based uh, verification and other uh, cross verification with the other work, we uh, conclude this event is less likely than the event. And we finally conclude that we found no certain evidence of the feeding patterns from all those evaluated events. And then, yes, so actually, we suppose it's only simple configuration like the point mass lens model, but in order to mimic the reality as much as possible, we may consider another lens model, which is showing this, uh, which is regarding the ex expanded uh, source tray, the lens plane. So if we are planning to uh, enhance our approach or our method, for the uh, next observing runs. So any question from audience on June? I think there's a noise, not a question. <laughs> I cannot recognize any signal from the noise. <laughs> so, this one is my actual last slide. So, yes. So, yeah. The reason why I sent the abstract with this that sentence is that showing this last slide. Actually, yeah, in, 
my work on any of my previous work doesn't uh, directly test the modified or alternative gravity theories in this um, gravitational ranging of gravitational waves. But uh, so I would like to finalize my talk with uh, this open question. So can gravitational lensing of the gravitational waves be testable for modified or alternative gravity theory? So my answer is the, I believe so, because uh, for example, when we look at this equation of the arrival time, uh, as I said, this psi term depends on this, uh, the potential of the lens system. So yeah, if we change the gravity model and the gravitation uh, gravity, gravity model also change the strength of the gravitational potential of the, around the lens system, along with the, the property of the gravitational wave signal itself, then probably yeah, it can, can be a good value for testing or different uh, gravitational uh, gravity theory models. So for example, actually this work is not for the gravitational wave, but uh, when we consider the Hojaba lift gravity with uh, the specific conditions, the coupling constant, the lambda equals one, then we saw that the neutron star structure in this uh, mass and radius relationship is the, showing the, the masses and radius becomes uh, heavier and larger compared to the uh, masses and radi radius uh, obtained from the GR. So yes, like this example, uh, yeah, if we, we change the gravity model and um, gravitational gravity theory, then it's quite natural to obtain altered uh, results from the, the typical gravitational lensing, not only the gravitational wave, but also in the electromagnetic waves, we may see different features from those, the known lensing uh, signature characteristics obtained with the GR. So yes, that's my open question and my temporal answer for the question. So thank you for your attention. Okay. That, I mean, so modifying gravity from here to something else may change the potential. Yes. But how, how do you tell by some weird or energy momentum tensor like the dark matter? Is it possible? I think so. Because yes, as I mentioned, some people like the, uh, for example, Professor Song Eun Jung in Seoul National University, he uh, considered the say the very similar lens mass ranges for uh, regarding the compact dark matter system. And yes, anyway, know that from the observation in the electromagnetic waves, uh, it can imagine the distribution of dark matter, even within the galaxy, galaxy system, like the galaxy halo and so on. So but anyway, so far as I know, uh, the gravitational lensing in the light uh, is agreeing with the prediction from GR. But, Anyway, the problem in the gravitational lensing in electromagnetic wave is that there is lots of noises. So we cannot get very clear observational data from the EM observations. So anyway, uh, if we can get a better, better resolution or the observing the, the kind of this phenomena, then we may see some uh, fluctuation or some deviation from the known phenomena. Then I think that's a possible possible room for testing the gravity model. <laughs> so I have I have a question. Yes. 
Okay, so in your expression for the arrival time of lens signal, since yes. it is just a shift, uh, the time shift, right? Uh, so this... that means uh, we do need some absolute times relative to what? I mean, the, we have to really compare from one timing and the two another, right? Uh, yes, when we what compute we... the time delay, yes. But how do you measure uh, the time delay? Uh, in the detection of gravitation waves, we know that when a signal is arrived at each detector. And but uh, for that, uh, you have to know exactly the location, uh, the distance, and the all other parameters, right? Yes. So uh, for the detected gravitation wave signal we perform the parameter estimation to estimate the distance to the source possible source system and so on and not only the distance to but also for the mass or spins and so on so yes with the uh, observed or detected gravitational signal uh, we can estimate the possible parameters about the source system and also for the uh, landed gravitational signal, people already developed some parameter estimation method to estimate the uh, distances and masses for the not only the landed signal but also the original signals based on the detection of the uh, assuming the detecting the uh, all landed signals. So the uh, let's say, of course, if we do know all other parameters, uh, including the distance and uh, etc., uh, exactly, yeah. then the uh, maybe um, uh, uh, possible. But the, even in such case, uh, so it may not be easy to really pinpoint down the time zero or something. I mean, the, if we can compare some reference beam, another beam uh, that is not lens, then it uh, by comparison, uh, it may be easier. But the, I, I wonder if I mean the, this. Uh, it's a very interesting that the uh, modified gravity effects uh, uh, can be measurable through the time delay uh, or time uh, time difference. But uh, the, the real measurement, uh, either unless we know all other parameters very precisely, so uh, time zero, for example, including time zero, and, or uh, the, some, if there is some reference beam, that will be very nice, but uh, it's very hard for me to imagine. Yes, uh, actually, the equation shown in this slide is not the time delay, but uh, just arrival time. And arrival time, right. Yes, but uh, for the kind of any reference for the time measurement, uh, we may think the any of the signals detected in those the gravitational detector as the uh, can be a reference signal. And then we may seek the another lens counterpart uh, from the uh, past data or future data, not with any absolute reference signals or time, measurement time. Right, so the question to put it another way, presumably phi m, that is the modified gravity effect, is that right? No, no psi is the modified gravity effect, can, uh, oh, can apply this, yeah, apply okay. for the event and Phi okay, is the then, kind of the arbitrary parameters uh, which is make the this arrival time uh, becomes zero for uh, and the zero becomes the minimum of the arrival time. So phi okay. has the no physical meaning. Phi has no physical meaning and it's yes. only psi. Yes, so phi is kind of and, the, uh, yeah, the effect of psi can, so 
psi equal to zero and uh, however some little bit different uh, ds, the source distance maybe, yes. uh, would be uh, giving the same value of uh, the psi non-zero but uh, with the, some uh, different uh, distance or similarly the uh, gravitational lensing effect uh, information, right? So there are many variables floating around. So if we can compare with some other, uh, some reference, uh, that will be much nicer. Just like uh, when there was a supernova nine, uh, 1987, uh, at that time, uh, the neutrino arrival time and the really light signal, one is a really massless, the other one is if there is any tiny mass, et cetera. The time difference can is uh, uh, compared to we are comparing two arrival time. So the time difference and the all the things is a physically measurable, right? Yes, yes, right. You're right. And uh, yes, yeah, so if we suppose the source of gravitational waves is uh, kind of the binary neutral stars, then Yes, we may see another reference signal from the electromagnetic wave observation, but uh, because in this work, we suppose the source is, is the binary black hole system, so it's uh, quite hard to imagine any possible reference to, uh, comparable another observation for the, the kind of the systems. So in the sense, I said, uh, any of the detected signal can be a reference one. Then uh, we may find uh, or seek the, any other possible lensing counterpart from the past data or future data. That's why I mentioned the, uh, a signal or detected signal can be a reference signal like you are imagining. OK, thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, I have a general question. Yes. Uh, this is the following. Usually, in the past, micro lensing has been used to measure the lens. Mm -hmm. So you have you, you look at the star, mm -hmm. and uh, if something passes in front, mm -hmm. you see a kind of change. Yes. And so you have a constant flux, mm -hmm. and you just wait for something passing. Yes. Here, the situation is completely different because the source, mm -hmm. there are very few, mm -hmm. and they last a short time. Mm -hmm. What is the probability that those few sources, so the, 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 the universe is a very empty place. Yes. So there is any kind of estimation, at least a crude estimation of what is the probability that you observe 10 lensing events and one of them is lensed? Very good question, <laughs> but it's very hard to answer. <laughs> Because in other words, suppose that your event, the event where you see some kind of possibility that you yes. like, can you really believe that? <laughs> uh, honestly, uh, I didn't believe the result at first. So I tried to see why it's not really <laughs> not a lens signal. So anyway, it's kind of kidding, but anyway. Anyway, you know, to check any possible new discovery of the micro lens or lenses events, we have to check or consider all possible measurement or metrics to verify the result. So, so consequently, we computed the p-value. It's quite general yet criterion for the testing any hypothesis in statistics so the, the p-value told, told us uh, is less likely but anyway for the uh, possibility of the kind of happening this kind of event is that it quite depends on the um, uh, population model of the possible language system not only the possible language system but also the uh, possible source system uh, which can produce the gravitational waves. But anyway, the setting is diff rather different, but uh, one work uh, estimate the possible detection rate for the micro-length gravitational wave is the 
uh, one per year uh, with some specific uh, restrictions for the estimation. But anyway, for the when actually I was the one of the closer, but when we estimate the, um, the detection rate, we suppose the source is at between the in the in, in terms of the redshift two, uh, the source is between the two and three, and the magnification factor is about the thirty. Then, if we or the any possible lens system or any possible source system located at the far distance, then probably yes, we may optimistically one event per year. But then there will be also a similar probability for uh, for the gravitational events with the uh, gravitational wave events with the visible counterpart. It's, uh... <laughs> Why not? I mean, mm. have a, it would be much easier to get to measure it. Right? Yes, but you know, to observe any EM visible counterpart, um, we have some events. Like yeah, we have some. We need some events, but anyway, uh, for example, for the observation of the GW seventeen way seventeen and the GRV seventeen way seventeen, uh, I think it's quite lucky event because the beam angle of that uh, binary merger is uh, direction to the Earth. But even though after that. Uh, there was three more gravitational wave events were detected, estimated from the merger of the binary neutron stars, but we didn't find any find any uh, EM counterpart from for those uh, three additional events. So yes, why not? <laughs> if we can observe multi-channel for the, the same event, then yes, it's quite easier to identify whether the signal is really lensed or unlensed one. Well. Okay. Uh, uh, can I ask a question? Okay. So, uh, I mean, first about that this uh, arrival, arrival time difference. So, if you uh, consider modified gravity, Yes, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, okay. <laughs> so in this formula, capital F depending on the frequency, right? Yes. But uh, generally, so if you consider modified gravity, TZ also may depend on the frequency. So have you uh, I mean, considered that kind of possibility in your machine learning? Uh, we haven't considered any modified gravity theory or models in mm. our works. But anyway, mm -hmm. as I mentioned, uh, the different gravity theory or gravity model not only changes the potential around the lens system, but also changes the property of the gravitational waves itself. So I think, yes, as you are suspecting mm -hmm. uh, the we can extract the gravitational wave signal or waveform from any of the gravity modified or alternative gravity model, then yes, that can be yeah, a test bed for uh, combining with the lensing phenomena. Mm -hmm. Okay, so another question is about your neutron star uh, plot for Hozaba gravity. In yes. the last piece. So the question is uh, so here the star is corresponding to GR case, which actually POV mass, right? Yes, right. Neutron star. Yes. So what's the current status of experiment? I, I heard that the, 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 I mean, the upper bound of this mass is a little bit marginal or bigger than this uh, POV limit. So what's the current status experiment? Uh, sorry, I'm not an expert on that field, mm -hmm. so I have no idea or updates about your question. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, thank you. 
Thank you. Okay. Uh, can you start ringing? Okay. Uh, 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 uh,